one of the things we have to do is we've got to have wisdom. You know, we've got to have wisdom on what's going on, uh, wisdom and leading of the Spirit. Um, and, and one of the ministries, uh, which anyone who's Spirit-filled, one of their ministries is laying on of hands. You know, it, that ministry is still going on. It's been going on since since a long time. <laughs> I mean, you know, they used to anoint oil in the Old Testament and lay hands on and so forth. I want to share a little bit about laying on of hands and uh, representation of laying on of hands, purpose of laying on of hands, results of laying on of hands, and to be careful about laying on of hands. Okay? So, you know, we must be led by the Spirit. Okay? So I'm going to share some scriptures and share some things uh, about laying on of hands because it is a ministry that we are involved in of laying on of hands. Amen? And we want to be ahead. The Spirit tells us things to come. And if we'll be ahead and the Spirit tells us things to come, you'll be led by the Spirit and know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and also I'll, and you'll have the discernment of whether you want someone to lay hands on you or not. Amen? Amen. That's, that's the big thing. Praise God. So, hallelujah. Let's, um, <laughs> let's turn to Psalm 24. Psalm 24. Psalm 24 and verse 3 and 4. Can we read this together, please? Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? Now, that's a powerful... If you think about it, who may stand in his holy place? In other words, who may represent the king? Does everybody get it? It's just not being... It's not some place it's who's going to stand in his place and represent him and he tells us in verse 4 it says he who has clean hands and a pure heart let me tell you something a pure heart and clean hands go together if your heart ain't pure your hands are dirty because what you touch is what affects your heart they work hand in hand. The extension of your hands is the extension of your heart. Jesus healed because he had compassion on people. Amen? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to what? An idol. An idol. Nor sworn deceitfully. Well, so he lets us know what would bring filth or contamination to your heart is idols, things that people worship and things that people say. They will cause your hands to become unclean because your heart is unclean. Does everybody get it? So we need to have clean hands and the way we maintain clean hands is they have a pure heart. They work together. Hallelujah. Okay. We got that part over. <laughs> Let's go to Psalm 141. Oh, thank you, Lord, for what's going to happen. Glory. Preparation. Psalm 141. In verse 1 through 4. Can we read it together? Lord, I cry out to you. Make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as in incense. Isn't that wonderful? Your prayers are incense to God. The lifting of my hands as an evening sacrifice. Did you know that when you're lifting your hands, you're, it's, a, it's a sacrifice to God? What you're doing, you know when a little baby comes up to a mom and dad, what's the first thing it does? Up. Up. When somebody comes to stick up a place, you know what they do? Stick your hands up. Well, the Holy Ghost says, stick them up. Amen. Amen. Why? It's a representation of surrender also. And, and the Bible talks about a wave offering. They used to wave what they were sacrificing, what they were offering to God. They used to wave it. Most of the time it was from the harvest. 
So we see the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice. And then he says what? Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing. To practice wicked works with men who work iniquity. And do not let me eat of their delicacies. Let me share something with you. People don't realize that if somebody's doing something wrong and you are a participant in it, even if you laugh at a joke that you shouldn't be laughing at, you've just eaten the delicacies of the wicked. You've eaten the delicacies of the wicked and you've opened a door for a devil to come in you. Does everybody understand that? Amen. You know why? That's what, that's what contaminates your spirit, man. Because what you've done is you've, the door to your spirit is your will. When you say, okay, door opens up. If you laugh at a joke that you should, you know that ain't right, if you, if you allow someone, let's say you know someone that's fornicating, and you ain't said nothing? Or you've even tried to protect that person? You've eaten of the delicacies of the wicked. You are a participant of what's going on. Does everybody get it? Because then your heart ain't with God. Your heart ain't with God. Your heart ain't pleasing God. Your heart's with pleasing man. And we don't want to get there. Why? Because it brings filth to our hands. Amen. See, the word touch is a representation of not only just physical touch, spiritual touch. You and I cannot touch unclean things. And the worst, the places where we touch unclean things more than anywhere is in our mind. It doesn't mean that an unclean thing isn't going to come. It's what you do with it. And what you choose to do with it determines whether you've touched it or not. Amen. When Eve was in the garden and the devil was questioning her, tempting her, swaying her, she said, you know, we're not supposed to eat or even touch this tree, the fruit of this tree. We're not even supposed to touch it. Amen. You know, so we know that God told them more than once. Because when Adam said it, he never mentioned touch. But when Eve said it, she mentioned touch. And she couldn't lie. Because they didn't know what lying was. So we know that dad, you know, did you ever know of a, a parent that never told the child more than once what to do and what not to do? <laughs> Remember, <laughs> don't touch that. <laughs> All day long. Hallelujah. <laughs> So praise God. So we must be careful not contaminating these hearts because when we contaminate our heart and our spirit, we contaminate our hand. Amen. Now what does he talk about lifting hands? Lifting hands. You know, a representation of lifting hands is a representation of reception, receiving. You know, there's antennas on TVs. You know what they're doing? They're receiving. <laughs> When you catch a ball, what do you do? You stick your hands out to catch something. It's a representation of receiving. Did you ever notice that in, in a service, when you lift your hands, all of a sudden you can feel God's presence? I mean, you feel it in your, in, in your hands, but sometimes first of anything. You just, you just know, and it kind of just, just runs down like, whoa, man, just something happening. I'm feeling God's presence. As soon as you lift your hands, it's like, whoa. Wow. What you're doing is you're acknowledging Him. And you're denying yourself. That's why so many people during worship, they put their hands in their pocket. That ain't worship, man. That's searching in the wrong place. That ain't worship. Surrender is a representation of honor and worship. You are acknowledging Him. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> and Psalm 90. All praise be to God. Psalm 90 and verse 17. All praise.
praise God. Uh, maybe we ought to start somewhere else in here. <laughs> Let's start at verse 14. Let's read it together. <coughs> oh, satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, the years which we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. What was he talking about? Establishing the work of our hands to bring glory to him. <laughs> what you do with your hands. Hands are a wonderful member. Thank God we have them. Establish the work of our hands, Lord. <clears throat> Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3. to God be the glory. In verse 27. Is everybody there? Let's read verse 27 in Proverbs 3. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do it. Oh man, there's power in your hand, isn't there? There's power in your hands. Well, if there's power in you, there's power in your hands. In other words, it's a representation of authority when it's given unto you. Jesus said, freely you receive, freely give. Amen? Hallelujah. I want to share a few things um, about our hands and the transference and the receptions of our hands. You know, share a couple of things in the Old Testament. Um, one of the things that they used to do in the Old Testament, internal Leviticus 16. <clears throat> Leviticus 16. See here. Did you ever hear the saying of a scapegoat? You know? Well, you know, it's biblical and that's where it came from. And the, in the Old Testament, um, to remove the sins of the people, they used to have two goats. Uh, and, and, and the one goat they would offer up to the Lord and the other goat they would lay hands on and they would send it out and what they used to do is they used to have a ribbon that would be red and it would be they'd either place it on the front door or somewhere on, 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 on the altar or, or not on the altar but somewhere where it was seen they'd place a red ribbon not only on the goat itself but they would place one on the um, on the tabernacle and what they would use to do is that when they'd offer up the one goat to the Lord and the other one, the priest would lay hands on the goat and it would transfer all the sins to this goat. And they would let it go out in the wilderness and basically what it would do is they'd basically bring it to a place and almost throw it off a cliff. Or I mean, it would just wander and would fall off a cliff or however it used to happen. And when the goat died, the ribbon would turn white. And uh, so, to this day, the Jews still believe that they're not forgiven because the ribbon never turned anymore. And uh, because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. See, so they were, st after Jesus, they were still doing rituals. And the, <laughs> and the ribbon wasn't changing no more because there was only one other way now for the forgiveness of sins because the blood of the Old Testament didn't forgive sins. It covered them. Jesus removed them. 
So this ribbon that used to they used to utilize to find out it would be a sign from God that their sins were forgiven would turn white. After it was a red scarlet, whatever they used to use. And uh, so this, they, what they used to do is lay hands on this goat known as the scapegoat and it would transfer the sins of the nation. Now, let me share something with you. If the priest could take the sins of the people and transfer it to a goat by a ritual, do you think somebody could lay hands on you that's doing wrong things and transfer them to you? Amen. You got that right. You got that right. In Leviticus 16, I just want to show you this in verse 21. It was known as the Day of Atonement. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of, the, of a suitable man. Wow. So they used to transfer the sins of the people onto this goat. And then the goat would go out in the wilderness, fall off a cliff and die. So this is where you and I must be careful about allowing people to lay hands on you. I do not allow people to come up on the service and lay hands on anybody unless it's been directed by this office. Amen. Nobody. I'll put you right back in your seat. I don't care if you're angry or whatever. You know, I was pastoring a drug place and uh, it was supposed to be in well, anyway, so it was supposed to be right before God, but there was a lot of things that weren't right. They used to have a smoking pit back there, right? I'd come in there and bring guys in one room, have them do deliverance prayers, cast out devils, anoint their heads, and I'd come back a week later and they'd be all messed up again. I'm like, what's up? Dudes used to come into that place who didn't smoke and began to smoke. Because the guys that were hanging out in the pit were laying hands on the guys that weren't smoking, and they began smoking. They were transferring these demons right into them. I was in a service one time and this guy, somebody came up. I, I was praying, laid their hands on my back, laid a hand on my back and began to pray. My back was burning. It was like somebody was leaving an imprint. I turned around, man, I, I man, get your hands off of me. This was at a service, not our own. I was in a service somewhere. Man, I began rebuking, cursing everything in me. Guys, I'm cleansing. I mean, I was casting down. Man, I, I, I just walked up I didn't, by myself. I'm like, man, I had people people I knew that were clean. Pray for me. Lay hands on me. I, mean, I was like, man, clean me up. Clean me up quick, man. I don't want nothing imparted in me. The same thing. When we were at the service the other night, when that woman would come up to get healing, and there's somebody from wherever laying, and the guy's got demons in him. Told him to back off. And you must have this discernment. Laying of hands on is a ministry. It is a requirement. It's been going on since God created man. It's a representation of sanctification. It's a representation of blessing. It's a representation of office and preparation. It's a representation of ordination by God. It's a representation of being sent out. They do it for missions and or missionaries and, and putting an office in the body of Christ. Laying of hands on is holy. And it's righteous before God. It's not something to just be played with where you just decide to go lay hands on someone because you feel like it. You be led by the Spirit of God because what you may lay hands on may come unto you if it ain't done by God. My wife and I were in the hospital. We brought this guy to a hospital. One time I was a baby in Christ doing all kinds of wild things. And uh, this woman came up. And we began to witness to her. And she was telling us she was a 
I mean, she was gone. Daughter of David, this, that. Was, she was married. She believed David was God. King David was God, this, that, whatever. She kept saying, lay hands on me, lay hands on me. And the Lord kept telling me, do not touch her. Do not touch her. So I said, listen. She kept begging us to lay hands on her. I said, no. So I said, we'll pray for you. I grabbed my wife's hand. I said, we'll pray for you, but I ain't laying hands on you. I'm not laying hands on you. We're going to talk about some of this stuff tonight. It's so important. Laying hands. You know, the church has gone bonkers. They think just because whatever, they can go lay hands on anybody when their own house isn't clean. When their own, when their own selves aren't clean. You don't go lay hands on anybody unless it's directed. And don't let nobody lay hands on you. You may have to start all over again. Amen? Amen. Man, you don't want nobody else's garbage. They do that in jail. <sighs> Drives me nuts. I keep rebuking them. Don't you do those in my service. Nobody gets up and lays hands on no anybody in my service. Because that's Jesus' service. Amen? They start doing that stuff. Oh, you know what they want to do? Somebody starts weeping and crying. They want to go over there and comfort them. Get your hands off of them. Let God deal with it. What can man do than you can? I mean, what can, you know, than God can do. Get your hands off. Let the dude weep. Let the Holy Ghost deal with them. Just don't get up in the soulish realm to go comfort somebody that's weeping and crying. Should have done that before he came into service. Hello? So I don't want to see nobody getting up laying hands on nobody, and I don't want to see anybody going over and comforting somebody while the Spirit of God is working with them. Amen. Let them be. Unless God has directed you through this office or whatever. Amen? Amen. We must stay in unity. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> in Genesis 48. Genesis 48. Hallelujah. In verse um, 18, somewhere around there. Start at 17, okay? And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim, Ephraim's head uh, to Manasseh's head. Now, what was he doing? Amen. Transferring a blessing. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father. For this one is the firstborn, put your right hand on his head. So what was he doing? He was blessing the firstborn, wasn't he? He was blessing them. So, you know, my wife comes to me every morning while I'm in prayer. And she says, okay, I'm going to work. And she comes in like a little puppy. And she comes in and lays her head down on the bed. And I lay my hand on her and I bless her. And I ask for the Lord's protection and whatever the Spirit leads me to. And I bless her. And I, 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 when I get up and, and at night, I bless my child while she's sleeping. And the next day, I bless her. Bless. Amen. You know? What's happening? Something's happening. You, there's transfer. See, your words don't fall to the ground. There's something going on. And we must bless our children. Amen. Now, when God tells you to go cast out a devil, don't go be, oh, bless you. <laughs> we had this dude that was really demon possessed. I mean, big time in jail. In fact, he, he had written me a letter in some language. And, and all the devil's names were, and some of the devil's names were in the book of Enoch that I read. And this dude was in a lot of witchcraft. So me and a brother went in there on a weekend. We started doing deliverance with him. And he was renouncing things and whatever. 
So one of the chaplains was walking by. We're in there casting. Now I said, hey, come on, chaplain. Help us cast some devils out of this guy. He came in there and started blessing him. I said, man, what you doing? What do you mean blessing him? Get out of here. We got to get these devils out. <laughs> blessing him. I'm like, wait a minute. There's a time for blessing, but there's a time for deliverance, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. So translating of hands is a blessing, isn't it? Go to Deuteronomy 34. Oh, hallelujah. Thirty-four. Do do Deuteronomy. Hallelujah. Laying on of hands. Praise be to God. Deuteronomy 34 and verse 6. Is everybody there? Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. Hey, this guy was in good shape, man. Praise God. At 120, I want to know what he was eating. Manna, that's what he was eating. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses ended. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had what? Laid his hands on him. So the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord had commanded him. What was he doing? He was installing office. He was installing office. Mo uh, Joshua was to replace Moses. Not only that, he was transferring the anointing, wasn't he? Everything that's installed in office is a transfer of the anointing, which is God's presence and blessing, isn't it? Hallelujah. So he was passing the anointing on, wasn't he? By what? By the laying on of hands. Praise be to God. Let's go to Numbers 8. Numbers chapter 8. Is everybody there? And verse 10. So you shall bring the Levites before the Lord. Before the Lord. Now what were the Levites? They were priests before the Lord, weren't they? They were ministers to the King of Glory. So you shall bring the Levites before the Lord, and the children of Israel shall lay their hands on the Levites. And Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord like a wave offering from the children of Israel that they may perform the work of the Lord. What were they doing? They were being sanctioned to be sanctified and separated unto God. See, so there's a lot of things about laying on of hands. He said it's a blessing, the transfer of the anointing, sanctification unto God, separation unto Him. Remember, your first office as a believer is priesthood. Your first office is priesthood. Everyone must fulfill that office. There's too many people trying to go out and be a warrior and never fulfilling their priesthood, and that's why they bring shame to the name of the Lord. Because the office of priesthood must be maintained. That never stops. Never. Amen? Praise be to God. <clears throat> oh, hallelujah. Let's go to... Uh... <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Acts 9. Acts 9.
You know, you're, you're going to go to churches and you're going to see people just fly out of the pews and lay hands on people. Run. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> Let nobody lay a hand on you. Believe me, I've gone to some churches I wouldn't even let the pastor lay hands on me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Then they got angry with me. Oh, the pastor wants to bless you. No, thank you. No, oh, thank you. I don't need his blessing. <laughs> Hello. Oh, they got real angry with me. <laughs> They tried to pull my wife and myself out of, don't you dare go out there. <laughs> well, they got real angry with me. Man, then they came running out to my car afterwards. Man, you missed the blessing of the Lord. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't need any more flesh than what I was dealing with. <laughs> I got it off my own flesh to deal with and pick up somebody else's. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We bless. <laughs> Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. In verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, laying his what? Hands on him who was Saul, who became Paul, brother Saul, and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may what? Receive your sight. Wow. That you may what? Receive your sight. And what? And be filled with the Holy Spirit. Whoa. See, the anointing breaks the yoke of bondages. Laying out of hands representation of healings and deliverance and so forth. And we'll go a little bit more into it. But it's not a man's hands that's being laid on you. We don't look at reception from a man. We look at reception from God. See, Paul, who was Saul then, couldn't see who was laying hands on him, could he? He couldn't see nothing. You know what he could only do? Receive. <laughs> that's all he could do because he was so bound by religion daddy had to put him on a fast for three days he said so I need to remove the lies the garbage the religion from you so you can't eat or drink man in fact I can't even let you see because you'll try and figure something out because you got too much knowledge But you ain't going to figure me out, Saul. You're just going to sit there and pray. I'm going to send my servant, and I'm going to work through my servant. You know, see, God works through man, doesn't he? In fact, God came as man. And when Ananias laid his hands on Saul, scales came off. And he was filled with the Spirit. Because the scales are removed when you get filled with the Spirit. Amen. And it says in verse 18, Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he rose and was baptized. Hallelujah. He got up and did the right thing. <laughs> so we see that there was a transference. There was God putting his spirit in somebody else. Hallelujah. I'll go to Acts 19 while we're here. Acts 19. In verse 11. Is everybody there? Acts 19 and verse 11. Now you got to understand something. Saul who became Paul was sanctified unto God for a long time. In fact, he really didn't go out and really start ministering a real lot for almost 14 years. He didn't follow the disciples after he got slammed. He took off. In 
and he learned the way of the Spirit for 14 years. And verse 11, and when he came back to the disciples, he came back a totally new man. And verse 11 said, now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. By the what? Unusual miracles. <laughs> That's pretty powerful. Now, these may be unusual miracles. Well, they saw many miracles by Jesus, didn't they? So this must have been some different miracles. Because if they were unusual, you know what I'm saying? They weren't just, they weren't the same. <laughs> they were unusual. I like that English. Huh? Unusual. <laughs> they were unusual <laughs> miracles. So they weren't a common miracle. In fact, they might have been some that Jesus didn't perform. Because there was a different circumstance involved, right? Sure. Hallelujah. So that even the handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and diseases left them and the evil spirits went out from them. Wow. Now we know that somebody touched the hem of Jesus' garment and got healed. But we never heard about Jesus taking his parts of his clothes and handing them out. You know. So that might be a representation of some of these unusual miracles. Then some of the... Um, itinerant Jewish exorcists <laughs> took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Well, let me tell you something. Sometimes, listen, if you ain't right with God and you go try and cast out a devil, they're going to say the same thing about you. In verse 14, also, there were seven sons of Scivia, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Now, those devils may be saying that right to you. Listen, who are you? You know? Who are you? Man, you got unclean hands. Who are you? Now look what happens. And it, <laughs> then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. <laughs> they got beat up. <laughs> they got beat up. <laughs> so we see that God can work unusual miracles through your hands. It's not you. It's God working unusual miracles, not us. Remember, the gifts aren't ours. They're His. Amen. Does everybody get it? The gifts aren't ours. When people say, oh, that person has the gift of prophecy. No, he doesn't. It's God's gift. God's just using that individual. That's all. In fact, most of the time, I come home from service and say, Lord, you know, I really don't know what you did. <laughs> he says, don't worry about it. It wasn't you anyways. I said, oh. Sometimes I feel like, you know what, Lord, I don't even feel like I was a part of that service. Everybody was having a good time. You just had me walking around doing all kinds of stuff. I, I really didn't feel like I was a part of it. Everybody was real, I mean, I felt your presence. I thank you, Lord, but, you know, everybody was having, you know. Except me. I said, don't worry about it. It ain't you anyways. It's okay. Hallelujah. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> Praise be to God. <laughs> really, the devil try and beat me up sometimes. Man, you really blew it. You know, this, that, whatever, you know. As soon as you come out of God's presence, you know what happens. Every serpent in the city's there trying to do whatever he's got to do. Bring doubt and fear and garbage and whatever. But praise be to God. So we see that God did unusual miracles through the hands of Paul, and we want him to do unusual miracles through our hands. You know? <laughs> oh, praise God. Um, and where are we going, Daddy? Okay. Let's go to Ezekiel 3. Ezekiel 
Ezekiel chapter 3. You know, praise God. I mean, there are so many powerful things in the Bible, you know, the, and how God used these men. And you know what? None of these guys were perfect. Nor were the women. Nobody was perfect. Everybody was messed up. <laughs> Everybody was messed up. Come on, think about it. Look at what Elijah did. Whoa, I mean, you know... Look at Elijah. Look at what the, these great men of God did. Come on, man. Elijah, what does he do? He kills what? 400 prophets. Calls fire down from heaven. And one voice of a woman, the man ran. Whew. I mean, you know, not that it meant whether it was male or female. But I'm just saying that one voice, and the guy ran. You know, I mean, think about it. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, Ezekiel, I mean, some of the things God did with Ezekiel are powerful, man. Amen. Powerful. I mean, he was gone. Can you imagine seeing the tabernacle of heaven? Oh, hallelujah. Take me home, daddy. For just a little while. <laughs> Ezekiel, what I say? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 3 and 16. Is everybody there? Now it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but the, his blood I will require at your hand. In other words, you know what? You're cursed for being disobedient. Amen. You will carry that iniquity. And verse 19, Yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wicked wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Ooh. Again, when a righteous man, now righteous man means a believer, Amen. turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity and I lay a stumbling block before him. You know how daddy lays a stumbling block before him now. He shall die because you did not give him warning. He shall die in his sin and his righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered. Let me tell you something. When you break covenant, everything that you've stored in heaven is gone. But thank God you can start over. Everything. When somebody breaks covenant, all the stuff that they have stored in heaven is gone. Wiped out. It says it right here. Listen. Hear this. Because you did not warn him, because you did not give him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered. Hmm. But his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man that, that, righteous, that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he took warning. Also, you have delivered your soul. So, see, we can get unclean hands just by not warning someone when God is telling you to. Does everybody get it? That's why you got to be in the Spirit to know what Daddy's saying. Hallelujah. Now, go, go to Revelation 20. Revelation 20. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And, uh, <clears throat> let's see, uh, verse 4. I 
And I saw the thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads and on their what? Hands. Let me share something with you. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. We know that these are specific marks that are going to occur during tribulation. But those marks can occur right now. Not as a permanent. Because once you receive the mark during this time, there's no turning back. But there can be a mark that you can receive even now by iniquity of your hands and your mind. Remember we said, what did he say? On the, fore, on the head and on the hand. You can be marked by the powers of darkness by touching unclean things here and here. Does everybody get it? So we must keep our hearts clean. We must stay clean before God. That's a wonderful thing about repentance. Let's go to James 4. James chapter 4. Glory to God. Oh, great scriptures. We've been talking about this a lot for the last few days. In verse 7, hallelujah. Is everybody there? <laughs> I think we all better read this one together. <laughs> Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now understand some Submit doesn't mean just submitting in the morning, submitting in the afternoon, or submitting at night. It means submit over every decision, every circumstance. It means submit to him in everything. If you can't submit to him in everything, you can't resist the devil in everything. Come on. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands. Isn't it amazing? He says, cleanse your hands. <laughs> you sinners, and purify your what? Hearts, you double-minded. You understand how they join together your hands and your heart. As a, they're, they're one. So we need to cleanse our hands and our heart. He rebukes them and calls them double-minded. <laughs> Glory to God. Why? Go to First Timothy. First Timothy chapter 2. Oh, bless your holy name, Master. Bless your holy name. In verse 8, Second, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Let's read this together. For, for Especially for the guys that think that it's, you know... It's not a God, it's not a man thing to lift your hands up. Hello? And verse 8 was it said, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Woohoo! So get your little hands out of your pocket and get them in the right places. Hallelujah. Lifting up holy. You notice he says holy hands. Your hands are holy. I don't care if you're a mechanic and you come home with filthy hands. That ain't what God's looking at. Your hands are still holy. You can't wash your hands to be holy. <laughs> I don't care how many manicures you get. If you're a sinner, your hands are dirty. <laughs> no manicure is going to make your hands clean. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> oh, praise God. Now look at what happened here. Go to Exodus in 17. Mm. 
Hallelujah. Exodus in chapter 17. In verse 8. Yeah. Is everybody there? Let's read it together, starting at verse 8. Now Amalek came and followed Israel and read him. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I'll stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Ooh, you notice the rod of God is a representation of your hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. Praise God. So do you know when you're praising and worshiping and your hands are up in the air? God's kicking butt on the enemy for you. Amen. It's that simple. You know why? Because your fight is not carnal. It's spiritual. The world is still trying to teach people to get delivered and healed and all these other things by carnal ways. It don't work. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy so that they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side, one on the other side. And his hands were steady until going down to the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So man, let me tell you, when you lift up both hands, God does more than one thing. <laughs> Amen? So when you praise and worship, don't praise and worship with your hands in your pocket. If you see somebody next to you, tell them, look, you get your hands out of your pocket. You're worshiping yourself. Worship the king. Amen? That's a form of humbleness. Surrender. I'll tell you, I, when I see people worshiping with their hands in their pocket, I've got to turn my head. Because the Lord says, don't go there. Don't go there. Okay, I ain't going to go there, Dad. You take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> don't go there because I want to go take the Bible and pop them. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'll come in my father's sanctuary. That way you get in here and lift and worship your daddy. I'll go home and watch TV. <laughs> Hallelujah. Psalm 22. So we see these hands are quite important, aren't they? <laughs> Glory to God. So now while when you're worshiping the Lord, somebody comes in, they start worshiping, and they have their hands in their pocket, you can give them an elbow. <laughs> Just don't give them a left hook. <laughs> Say, hey, man, you want to get free? Yeah, good. And take your hands out of your pocket and get free. <laughs> Psalm 22. <laughs> Let's see what it says here. Oh, verse 16. Listen to this. For dogs have surrounded me. Now we know this is about Jesus. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Wow. 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 See, the devil thought that if he could pierce Jesus' feet and hands, he couldn't do anymore. <laughs> but you got to understand something. There was an exchange here. His hands were pierced so yours could be free. His feet were pierced so yours could be free. He made the exchange for me and you that we could stretch out our hands in continuation of him stretching out his hands while he's here. In fact, the word says, and, and Paul, he, he was praying, he said, Lord, I pray for boldness that through your holy servant Jesus you would stretch out his hand or his arm with healings and signs and wonders. 
Hallelujah. So there was a great exchange for me and you. In fact, Jesus said, and go to Luke 23. Oh, hallelujah. Luke 23, verse 46. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, what did he say? Into your hands I commit my spirit. Wow. Into your hands I commit my spirit. You know what? We need to do that every day. Amen. Lord, I commit my spirit into your hands, my spirit, soul, and body. I commit them to you. What other hands would you rather be in? <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's go to, um, oh, this is good. That's good. Let's go to 2 Timothy first. Second Timothy chapter one. Is everybody all right? Second Timothy chapter one. Yeah, Second Timothy chapter one. Let's read this together. This is Paul writing to Timothy. Therefore, I remind you to what? Verse 6. Sorry. <laughs> Are we there now? Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So there's an impartation of a gift, isn't there? He says, stir it up. Well, how you stir it up? Praying the Holy Ghost. Stir it on up. And verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. So obviously, Timothy was going through something, wasn't he? Probably fear. Amen? Probably fear. Because he said, what did he say after that? God has not given us fear. Hallelujah. So we see that laying on the hands is an impartation of gifts, isn't it? Oh, praise God. Now I'll go to 1 Timothy 5, since we're here. And go to uh, verse 22. So I'll give you confirmation about 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 22. Is everybody there? Come on, let's read it together. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 22. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. Hallelujah. Don't lay hands on people quickly. you got to be led by the Lord. Amen. Amen? Praise be to God. So we got to be wise. Go to 1 Timothy. Well, we're here. <laughs> Go to chapter 4 and 14. Four fourteen. Let's read it. Do not neglect the gift that is in you which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of who? The elders. Oh, the eldership. Praise God. Go to James 5. James 5. James chapter 5. 
Oh, Jesus, you're good to us. Amen. You're faithful when we're faithless. Amen. James chapter 5. And, um, let's see. Wow. It's a lot here. <laughs> Hallelujah. James chapter 5 and verse. Okay. Verse uh, 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your mercies that are coming upon you. And verse 1. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is any cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Wow. Who is the church? The elders. Now, don't get me wrong. The elders are also a representation of the more mature. Not that God can't use anybody. You know. Believe me, if you see somebody hurting or whatever, don't let the devil tell you, well, you ain't been a Christian in just about three days. If you're filled with the Spirit of God, you lay hands on that person. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and the prayer of the faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. And, he, and if he has committed sin, he will be forgiven. So we see that the elder laying in the hands, the anointing on the head, laying in, brings what? Healing, doesn't it? Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, another confirmation. Go to Mark 16. And Mark 16. Our famous scripture. Glory to God. In verse 17, let's read this wonderful scripture together. And these signs will follow those who believe. And now what does believe mean? Follow. follow. These signs will follow those who follow. Amen. Ain't no sign going to follow you if you ain't following. Amen. <coughs> In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly... It will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. It says anyone who follows. Praise God. Anyone. Now, you may think, well, man, I'm just... I haven't done that yet. Well, you're about to. Amen. <laughs> you're about to. God has no respect to a person. <laughs> Praise God. Go to Acts 19. Mm -hmm. 
All glory. You know, I used to think that when I was a baby, I used to think, man, somebody, when somebody would pray for somebody to receive the Holy Spirit, I thought, man, that must be a gift. That person must, it must be just a gift to lay hands, and you know, that must be the gift of, of, they must have the gift of giving the gift of the Holy Spirit, you know. <laughs> and this sweet woman of God just came up to me and said, no, you just pray it and just trust God and they receive it by faith. Praise God. I started doing it and never stopped. <laughs> Hallelujah. They just received by faith. Man, I met her out in the pouring rain to get that answer. <laughs> I was waiting for her to come out of work. I was out there. It was raining. I was trying to find some shelter. I got to know how you get people to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. And it was so simple. <laughs> Just lay your hands on them and they receive by faith. Come on, I've been out there soaking wet for that. <laughs> it can't be that easy. Oh, but it is. <laughs> Praise God. My wife and I, my wife was with me. <laughs> she was wet too. We were trying to go out on the shelter and stuff. Thing was leaking, you know, whatever. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, uh, you know, we're talking about this. So, Paul, let's go start from verse 1. And we'll go to 1 through 6. Praise God. Let's read it together. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, did, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you got saved? That's quite simple, isn't it? What, look what their answer is. <laughs> so they said to them, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. It's unfortunate that many people invite the Holy Spirit but don't want to have communion with them. Or let him do what he wants to do. Oh, we invite you, Holy Spirit. Okay, let's go to our traditions. Huh. So they didn't even hear that there was the Holy Spirit. But they were saved. Right. See, there's a terminology between saved and born again. One of these days, God's going to let me preach it in other places. But right now, they wouldn't get it. They'd think I was a cult. <laughs> they already do. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had what? Laid hands on them. The Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Glory to God. <laughs> they got born again. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. You know, one of the things, you know, that, that's where the scripture comes into effect also. You know, when you're laying hands on someone, if it's directed by the Lord, you'll know. Now, the devil may try and hit you and tell you, well, man, you ain't this. You, you know what I'm saying? And that's where you got to, the Holy Spirit will quicken you to the Scripture. He who's in you is greater than he is in the world. He who's in you is greater than he who's in the world. Now you got to understand something. Yes, as a believer, you and I should be prayed up all the time, shouldn't we? We should be filled with the Spirit of God. But let me tell you something. If you, didn't, if you weren't prayed up that day, and there was somebody hurt. And the Lord says, lay hands on. Don't tell the Lord, I can't. I haven't been prayed up because it's not you. Amen. 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 It's not you anyways. Amen. You know, we're looking for this feeling before we do something. If you're waiting for the feeling before you do something, you'll never do it. 
because it's not you. Believe me, it took a lot of beating up and dying to finally realize it ain't me. It's not me. So if you're waiting for the... It's just like with forgiveness. If you're waiting for the feeling of forgiveness, you'll never forgive. <laughs> it's not about a feeling. It's not about a trying. It's about a doing. God is preparing us to walk over this fear. To put it under our feet. Listen. If he says lay hands on someone and pray, you're going to go, well, I don't know what to pray. You know what he's going to tell you? Pray in the Holy Ghost. You'll pray the perfect will. Amen. Pray in the Spirit. What are you worried about? You know, I just don't know how to pray, Pastor. Good. Pray in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> you know how to pray. <laughs> That's why God gave you tongues. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, let's end with this. Psalm 92. I got a lot more scriptures, but I think we got the point across. read verse 4. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. Hallelujah. We will triumph in the works of his hands. Amen. So listen. Laying on of hands is a ministry. Like I said, I've got a lot more scriptures on this, but I don't believe that we need to go with so all of these, I, I believe that the point has been put across. Your hands are holy, and it is your responsibility to keep them clean. Be careful who you allow to lay hands on you. One thing that I'm telling you, when I go to a place and people are just coming out of their seats and laying hands on, on people, uh-uh. Don't be a part of it. You use wisdom. You want to be led by the Lord. You be careful who lays hands on you, and you be careful who you lay hands on. Amen? Because these are holy hands, and you are holy. And we must be directed by the Holy Spirit to maintain holiness. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Father, we lift you holy hands. Lord, and we just thank you. We ask that you continue to anoint these hands of ours, Lord. Continue to strengthen our spirit, renew our soul, crucify our flesh, and let the rivers of living water flow through us and through our hands and through our mouth to change lives for your glory. Amen.